right saying this is actually um i'm excited about this talk because it is i think i do believe it's the first time that metamodernism the context of metamodernism has been applied to our field of um digital interactive immersive documentary and it was only uh it was actually when putting together the title for this talk because the original title was polyphonic documentary and i just wasn't happy with that because it, it was um it's a term you know we've been to, i've talked about that a lot of times and i wanted to move things on and i had some thoughts churning away in my mind and stefano and i had written an article this summer on decolonizing interactive documentary practices that will be out um, in a book with Rootledge in the new year, where we were talking about polyphony, we were talking about multi perspectivity, and we were talking about um, you know decentering the narrative, decentering the author, and, and having multiple narratives within a text. But I kept saying, and we kept saying, there's an issue here in that polyphony itself is is a belief system it, it's an approach you know it's a philosophy it's not neutral so um you know that there seemed to be a contradiction there in in the polyphony and i've now realized is, is kind of a bit of a grand narrative in its own right and so we, we kind of had this tension I, I didn't feel we'd resolved it in that article and then anyway when when i was kind of researching for a title for this talk i suddenly hit on that's it metamodernism you know that that works within this context of polyphony. So what you're getting today is quite fresh thinking. It's kind of quite fresh in my mind. Uh, it's come out of those dialogues with ongoing dialogues with Stefano. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see, see where we go with it and hopefully it'll provoke lively discussion. So I am planning to talk for about 45 minutes, maybe, and to allow a good decent time for discussion. I'm going to start by just talking about a bit about IDOCs and um, where when it began, you know, the I, the IDOC symposia, the first one in 2011. We talk about the confluence of the documentary industry and um, my own interests in multi perspectivity. I'm then going to go back a bit in time just to kind of make it really clear that I my own interest in polyphony. This is an approach and an interest that I bring to digital documentary and that I brought that approach very much to IDOCs and those symposia. So for me, that's why I set up IDOCs with Sandra and John Dovey and then with Mandy coming on board. So for me, that's I mean, that's what my core interest is, is multi-perspectivity. Um, and uh, that's what drives me to do it. So now that IDOCs has expanded, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, I, I'm very clear that rather than Kate Nash last week, who took this expansive view of the whole field and you know her book on interactive documentary theory and practice covers the whole field, which is, you know, as it's growing, that's an extraordinary achievement. Whereas I'm, I'm very clearly bringing a perspective into that field. And I'm very clear that the IDOCs field is more than this. But for me, this is a very, very core set of debates within the field that define that original, a lot of the people who originally became involved in the IDOCs community, I think we have a shared, a shared interest in this. So I'm flying the flag to keep that shared interest going, to keep that aspect of the field alive and well. So I'll talk about that and a bit of, um, one of the things about metamodernism is that it's quite self-reflexive. So I'm going to bring myself into this and be quite reflexive about myself and my own position within this. So I'll do a bit on that and then I'll talk a bit more about the immersive turn and um, the need to keep interactive and immersive within digital documentary and dialogue with each other. Then I'll talk a bit more about more recent collaborative work with Stefano on polyphony and our polyphonic documentary project. I'll talk a bit more about the principles behind polyphony and the work we're doing around Bakhtin and, and his work on the polyphonic novel. Um, and then um, I'm going to situate this within the context of metamodernism. So I'm, I'm going to say why, for me, kind of stumbled across, across metamodernism, why that whole set of ideas seems very relevant and very appropriate as, um, as a framing device for this work. But that's very fresh and that's up for discussion. And, you know, it's, um, it's not fixed. It's 
well, metamodernism is itself, one of its principles isn't fixed, it's an evolving uh, emergent set of ideas. Um, and you can never find absolutes within it anyway. That's partly why I like it and think it's relevant. Uh, and then having done that, uh, I'm then going to bring it back to IDOCS and talk about what contribution I think digital documentary and the debates within interactive documentary in particular uh, bring to these wider debates about polyphony and metamodernism. Because obviously polyphony and metamodernism isn't only the preserve of digital documentary, it's much bigger, but how can digital documentary debates about interactivity and immersion, you know, what, what do they have to offer this field? So that's the plan. Uh, and as I say, I can't see on this view, I can't see my next slide. So hopefully I won't surprise myself too much. And hopefully what I say will flow. Um, just you'll see on this slide, my favorite phrase, everything is deeply intertwingled. <laughs> I really like it because it's quite a tactile world. Intertwingles as a word makes you want to sort of twingle your fingers. It's a bit sort of magical. But it's, it comes from Ted Nelson, who talks about that in relation to um, computers and knowledge and his original vision, you know, for what has become the World Wide Web of the connectivity and the ability to break down silos, break down binaries, look at the interconnection between things. So that's where that phrase comes from. And uh, I think that, again, drives uh, a lot of what I'm talking about here in terms of interconnectivity and breaking down binaries. So now it doesn't want to move. Why doesn't the slide want to move? Oh, it does. Good. Um, so, yes, this is a this is a slide from the IDOCS website. So. Uh, presuming all of you know what IDOCS is, uh, Anna mentioned, it's we're based in Bristol. We're a research group um, looking at evolving documentary practices with a particular focus on interactivity. Originally, IDOCS stood for interactive documentary. And then in 2016, we opened up the eye to include immersive documentary, put them into dialogue just to reflect the changing platforms and the changing focuses within the industry and also within wider culture, as we kind of had this immersive turn. Um, but this slide's quite nice. It's still there because it, it, it sort of just places IDOCS in where it started out, which was, um, so this is a, just an image that came from our 2012 symposium. And you can see it's about multiple, it's about multiple pathways and it's about, um, you know, breaking, narratives from being unisequential to having multiple routes through multiple ways of investigating things, which opens up new ways into thinking about multiple perspectives and multiple points of view. So that was at the time in 2011, that's what the industry was interested in. And the, the, the web doc platforms were the shiny new toy. That was the latest piece of technology that was being explored. So in 2011, there was this perfect confluence between my own interests, Sandra Gaudenzi, who was doing a PhD in interactive documentary and what was happening in the industry. So it seemed a perfect time to set up this symposium, the IDOCS group, which has always been a dialogue between industry, academia, communities, um, and, and a really nice exchange of dialogue. It's not, it's not a commercial space, so it's not a marketplace. So people from industry genuine, genuinely are interested in sharing ideas and you know learning from the ac academic world as much as the academic world's learning from industry and again these words are quite fluid you know we're quite open-minded about what we mean by academia and industry and there's lots of practitioners working in academia and all the rest of it so this is just you know my, what I'm doing this is this is being true to that original idea of multi-perspectivity so just backtracking a bit so yes this was one of the tweets that I always like to show the particular top one Ramona Pringle interactive documentary appeals because the world's complicated there's not always one story but many intersecting so you know right from the beginning that was IDOX 2016 but you know complexity has always been you know a core right at the heart of IDOX and then Sandra talks about meta documentaries as a way to resist power structures stay open to interpretation. So core to IDOCS, and then as Anna's already said, reeling back, that core interest sort of stems from my growing up in Leicester, which is um, in the UK, 
It's the um, first ethnic majority city. So it's a very mixed city since the 1950s. It's very multiracial um, diversity. It's, it's a pretty harmonious city, but you know, diversity is really important. So I grew up, I grew up in a white middle-class suburb and my parents you know, were quite traditional and very English. So I've had, I've had quite a colonial, you know, that sort of colonial background, I suppose, is, you know, being reflexive is part of me. But then I grew up in Leicester and in my school, uh, rubbed up against um, the multi-ethnic aspects of the city. And I did experience, there was a lot of racism, there was a lot of ignorance, there was a lot of misunderstanding in those early days when they started to mix things up in the schools, because Leicester was quite progressive. And I always felt really uncomfortable. And that's kind of what took me into anthropology and geography. And I traveled and I actually followed um, networks, family networks from Leicester of the Lahana community back into India. And I did my undergraduate geography dissertation on migratory networks and perceptions of place and home between those two places um, from Gujarat and from Leicester, and also looked at the um, migration routes through Uganda as well. So that kind of opened up my interest in diversity, multicultural communication that's foundational and stayed with me really. And just this is a quote from Question Bridge, you know, and again, I really believe this diversity makes tolerance more than a virtue. It makes it a requirement for survival. So as Anna said, I am very engaged. I'm very applied. So I might be talking about metamodernism, but for me, it's always bringing it back down to kind of, you know, the situation now, what, what's important, what matters and how we go about living our lives. Um, so yeah, we, we need, you know, the more diversity, the more different perspectives we've got, the more chance we have of solving problems, in my view, because we've got different perspectives and one perspective won't solve all problems. And I think that about science as much as anything else, I think science can solve a lot of problems, but it won't solve all our problems, uh, which I'll come back to when I talk about metamodernism. So anthropology, Ruth Benedict, you make the world safe for human difference. So, you know, anthropology is interested in difference, celebrates difference, um, and then also, you know, looks at what it is to be human and all the rest of it. So I started off in geography and then I switched over to anthropology for my PhD. Um, and yeah, so I'm finding actually I'm working more with geographers and anthropologists as time goes on, which feels like a good place for me to be. Um, so this was my PhD in 2003, which was on interactive multimedia which in a way was the precursor to interactive documentary. It was the Apple human computer interface, spatial configurations, multimedia, multimodal communication. And I was always interested in, you know, what ideas and arguments we could communicate, you know, new ways, new forms of knowledge, basically. And that was at the Royal College of Art, but my supervisor was Alan McFarlane in Cambridge, who is a, a, an eminent anthropology professor who worked in Nepal for over 30 years. And he was the person who taught me about pathways to knowledge. And um, I'd spent a year in Indonesia, in Java, teaching English when I, was, when I was 18. I did a year's voluntary work. And I learned from that as well, that Western science and rationality you know, has its place and is really helpful in certain contexts, but so is kind of the more Eastern philosophies and the folk philosophies and indigenous knowledge. And what Alan taught me is that these things don't have to be in conflict. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be, you know, like yin and yang, the, these things can work together. And uh, so he really taught me that for my PhD and he was a bit of a polymath. And again, that stayed with me. And when I come back to talking about metamodernism, it perhaps, hopefully it'll show why this seems to make so much sense to me and why it's kind of something I feel, you know, quite deeply, it's not just an intellectual, idea that makes sense. So I'd been working uh, for my PhD and then postdoctorally with an anthropologist in Oxford who'd spent 40 years in the Sudan or doing intermittent field work. And over that from the 19 late 50s onwards. Um, and from that time, she'd worked with the same group of people and charted basically 
that group of people in the small village that she'd been studying in the late 50s, 60s, those people were displaced and they became sort of at the shatter belt of major political upheavals of the second half of the 20th century. And just, just by accident of where they lived, they got caught up in this. And um, this is the story sort of from the underdog. And it's the story that wouldn't have been told had Wendy not been working with them. You could say it's a colonial narrative, but if Wendy wasn't there, none of this would have been recorded. And she ended up being an advocate for peace, um, the peace process in the Sudan. So she became a very active, you know, a bit of an activist really, um, from being a witness to becoming very actively involved in, in helping out. But we made a website as part of that work and it had different themes, thematic clusters, and then it had different perspectives within that. And these are all video clips that you can navigate around. So it's that I was already working with these interfaces. So this I made in 2006, I think it was, and it was part of my PhD that I'd finished in 2003. So this way of thinking was already how I was working. And I brought that to IDOCS. Um, and then we were looking at, through her archive, looking at, um, I can't go into detail, but this is some footage she took in the, in the 60s. And then that's Tende, one of them. And then this is Tende's son looking at that picture in her book. And then that's audio recording from the 60s. It's very reflexive, you know, talking about, oh, that's my father. And then you can hear Wendy talking to him about it. So we were looking at using juxtaposition to juxtapose through time and look at continuity and change and um, yeah, working with the human computer interface and the new methods. And then we had all her photographs and then I started recording her talking about the, the different photographs. So she was narrating bits of her own database. And then we had the idea that some of the subjects would also become narrators of this database. And um, this is a bit of an ongoing project that stopped and started for many different reasons. Um, but it's all about database narrative um, and you know what you can pull out from archives and how you can use computers to narrate different aspects of that. So I wrote about that. That was 2010, Spatial Montage and Multimedia Ethnography. Uh, that's online. Um, and that again just kind of sets out the way I was thinking at the time. And then in around about the same time, this project came out um, from Arte in France, pioneering, you know, the web doc. And again, these are everyone who knows IDOCS knows this. Two video clips across the divide of Israel, Palestine, looking at everyday life and you could move between them. And there were 40 days they recorded and you could each day you could compare and contrast. And then you could go in it a different way through the characters who were appearing. So you could see there was a complete synergy between what I was doing, what the industry was starting to do at that moment in 2011, when we set up IDOCS. So of course, our first symposium, Brache, who was the producer of that came and gave a talk and he made the provocation that design is part of the content, which if you go back, or well, back to there, you know, the design of that wall you know, separated them, but through interactive media, you could bring people together that wouldn't normally be in dialogue with each other. And, you know, he had ideas to actually use that to create real dialogue, but it was difficult because of the context of the situation. And people have theorized that actually, this is a false bringing together because actually there's power structures between Israel and Palestine and it, all sorts of really interesting conversations this has raised about, complexity, spatial montage and power structures. And, you know, the interface might make it seem equal, but it's not. So that's something to pick up on. And then IDOCS had the immersive turn. So in 20, 2018, I think we formally um, opened up the eye in IDOCS. And it's just quite handy that the eye could also in incorporate immersive. But I was very clear, um, you know, for me, this isn't my interest you know, immersion, immersive tech and, and this kind of push towards VR, which, which is all about presence. It's more about presence than it is about agency. And it's closer to filmmaking and it's closer to unisequential formats because it puts you in a world, immerses in, in, in that world. It doesn't leave cognitive gaps. In, I mean, all things, films are interactive. Everything's interactive to a degree, but with IDOX, there's a cognitive interaction of choice making. That's another, it's just another 
type of interactive that that um, forces you to make choices as you're going through it. Um, so I, yeah, just sort of mind the gap. And for me, I'm interested in in those gaps and where those gaps are and those gaps of decision making, where where you're. It's a bit like Brecht in a way, and yeah, you know where where you are. Um, you're not just completely immersed in something, and it's not just fed to you. Um, you have to kind of engage with it, and that that's what the um, principles of IDOX as it, as it first um, was as interactive documentary were about. Uh, so I wrote a response just to the immersive turn, which is the piece Anna has talked about. I think that's still, uh, you know, that's a good introductory point to what IDOX was about originally. Uh, what does it mean? Why does it matter? And um, it's all in there. It's online. You can read that on, on the website. But it was very much saying we've got to keep interactivity in the frame you know, just because the industry is moving towards immersive I mean, immersion obviously means different things, but I was talking about immersive technology, which is what the industry was interested in and platforms, you know, is that going to be the latest business model? So that's where all the funding was going. That's where all the commissions were going. The web-based doc, you know, gradually no longer became commissioned because there wasn't a business model for it. But I was very clear that um, in community, at community levels, in places like um, health studies, uh, all sorts of areas where interactive documentary still um, was important so that we needed to keep that alive because we're in a university as, as part of the debates. And let, let's not just have interactivity sitting underneath immersive technology. So it's not just about interactive formats within immersive technology, but also let's have it in an equal dialogue between interactivity and immersion. So, um, yeah, we've, we've kept, kept with that and um, we, we've kept the flag of interactivity flying. And of course, now interactive narrative is having a bit of resurgence with things like Netflix and Bandersnatch and um, various new tools that are coming out. So I thought it's just a case of just holding on, uh, moving to thinking about these more at a scholarly community level. And then at some point, the industry will probably come back round. But, you know, this is more than... The documentary industry anyway these documentary ideas and values have wide attraction in um, scholarly discourse and scientific discourse you know complexity is more than documentary making you know how we engage with complexities is a big deal across the board and what does interactive documentary have to say about that so that's why stefano and i got involved in um, working together and um, picking up the idea of multi-perspectivity through polyphony and um, polyphony had been mentioned here and there I, I mentioned it in a paper I wrote and um, Sharon Daniel had written about polyphony an interactive documentary but we'd never really been formally established as a site for research within um, IDOX so that's what Stefano and I did you know we kind of said let's pick up these debates that already exist in documentary about polyphony and let's see what IDOX brings to them and, and what, how um, we can move those debates and discussions on in relation to evolving emerging platforms. So we did a panel on it, so IDOX 2018 uh, that Anna was part of, and um, that was great. And then from that, we did a special issue of Alphaville in 2018, I think it was, uh, on the poetics and politics of polyphony. That's online and it's got an interview with Florian, um, it's got an interview with Sharon Daniel, it's got papers from Anna, there's, there's loads of really good, um, you know, key IDOX people talking about polyphony in there. And Stefano and I wrote a, a paper called um, Interactive Documentary as a Research Method. And so again, just thinking about that wider context of interactive documentary beyond just broadcasting and, and the commissioning world of festivals. So we kind of have gone a bit underground within the documentary field, but we felt that it's still, these are issues are still very relevant to documentary. And, you know, the database isn't going away in a hurry. Computers aren't going away. Complexity is not going away. So um, yeah, that's what we thought. And so more recently we've set up a project and we called it Polyphonic Documentary. And we're co-creating, we've got about 70 IDOX people from the community around the world who are involved. We've got a community on Discord. And the idea here is that we are going to co-create 
a model for new approaches to polyphonic documentary. Uh, we're going to test out ideas, creating a community of makers with a theoretical underpinning and practical approach. Various people here today are part of that. Um, and yeah, we're just kind of exploring together what polyphony might, what polyphony is and, and how that has relevance in the IDOX field. So we're doing collective reading, collective sharing of projects and practices and collective uh, use of different tools. Um, so going into a bit more detail on polyphony, um, poly, many, poly sounds. So many sounds, many voices, uh, many different perspectives. Uh, and then we're sort of drilling into this through Bakhtin, who some people say, why are you looking at Bakhtin? You know, he was, he's old now, that's not current anymore. But we think uh, it's still his work and his ideas. People have said he was one of the most visionary theorists of the 20th century. You know, he was writing in 1929 about um, relativist ideas and relationalism. And, you know, was pretty much, I would say, a, a visionary thinker and that his ideas do have a lot of relevance. So he wrote the polyphonic multivocal novel constructed not as the whole of a single consciousness, uh, a whole formed by the interaction of several consciousness is none of which entirely becomes an object for the other. So it's this idea about you have the author and the author's still present, but the author is giving autonomy to the other characters in the novel and that they are in a in dialogue with each other. So the author becomes part of a dialogue rather than all the characters being there to serve the monological voice of the author. And that's the key thing. So it leads to multiple voices and it opens up multiple perspectives. He, Bakhtin talked about Dostoevsky. I mean, he was Russian, so he was gonna pick a Russian novelist. But he, he talked about Dostoevsky as being the kind of a really good example of the polyphonic novel and it's the novel of ideas so through having these voices in dialogue with each other uh, it enables you to explore ideas so it's not just community you know we've got different voices it's actually using that to explore big themes of the day or ideas that, that matter um, so yes it's dialogism it's all about dialogue rather than monologue a single point of view so I'm saying this truth is not born this was um Back to, it's in 63, but he wrote this in 1929. It's not born, it's not to be found inside the head of an individual. It's born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of their dialogic interaction. So this, you know, is kind of leading out to the ideas of emergence and that, you know, things are evolving and that our understanding of the world is not fixed. You know, it can evolve and it can evolve, evolve through our interaction and dialogue with others and not just other people, but with our, our environments and our interactions, you know, with, with nature, with the natural world, uh, as well as with other humans, just seems really relevant. Uh, I just wanted at this point to be really clear that polyphony within documentary is not, you know, it's not new, it's not a new discovery that is unique to uh, the digital documentary. This is an example, Terence Malik's film, The Tree of Life has been called uh, a polyphonic film. So John Bruins, um, he, he theorized about the poly polyphonic film in I think it was the early 2000s about preserving the end independence of individual elements within an overall fusion. And here's Roger 2008. Um, it doesn't just depict simultaneous events and assemble multiple plots. It achieves true, true cinematic polyphony by depicting simultane, simultaneity without unity, multiplicity without completeness. So, you know, there are polyphonic films. This is an example, um, somebody who used to work with us at UE, they made a film called The Secret City, uh, I think it was 2012, and they had the monological voice of the Corporation of London, and then they put that into dialogue with all the dialogical voices of the people who were living in London. And they called it a dialectical film. It was an academic, it was a film made in an academic context, but it really opened up ideas about polyphony. And so, you know, that was 2008. You know, we're, we're not claiming that we are the, you know, we are the polyphony in documentary people. Um, so yeah, again, juxtaposing different interviews, building up a dialogical voice that sets itself against the official voice of the Corporation of London. 
the cumulative polyphony of images and sounds and traversing disciplinary boundaries. That sounds very similar to some of the things we've been exploring within IDOCs. Well, it is very similar, similar intention. Also in novels, she won the Nobel Prize. Um, her book's been described in 2015, polyphonic writings. You know, So that's just to clarify that we polyphony is broader than IDOCs. So what role does interactive documentary have to play in all this? Brings us to Janet Murray, who's written about and spoken about dramatic agency. This is worth, it's a future of storytelling talk that she gave, um, where I'm afraid now, because this is all quite new, um, there's quite a few words. So I am going to do the thing you're not supposed to do, read out what I've put on a PowerPoint. It's just, just to keep me focused. <laughs> but um, anyway, she says, I believe we've now reached the limits of what we can understand about the world by uni sequential formats. So she talks about not linear, but uni sequential, such as books, movies, and TV shows. As a culture, we're collectively creating the building blocks of a radical new form of storytelling that allows us to take multiple points of view, to repeat the same scenario, to compare alternate possibilities. We're doing this because we desperately need such interactive and immersive stories in order to make sense of the world we live in. So that's her rally and cry for why interactive media and interactive narrative is still important uh, within the mix of, um, you know, alongside the more uni sequential formats. Um, and then just looking at, you know, why that might be important. I don't need to tell you, you know, um, it's quite good for looking at speculative futures and, and for doing simulations and for thinking, you know, documentary, provoking a discussion about the future. Uh, and what futures we might want to create in response to the climate emergency that we find ourselves in, hugely relevant. Uh, oh, Nobel Prize for Literature, um, she said, we don't yet have ready narratives for the future, but even for a concrete now, for the ultra rapid transformations of today's world. We lack the language, we lack the points of view, the metaphors, the myths and the fables, yet we frequently see Anachristic, ana, anachronistic narratives that can't fit the future, you know, and that's the backlash, that's the Trumps of the world and, you know, uh, well, Boris Johnson's of the world, if you like, that are trying to hark back to the good old days or, you know, or, or trying to use old narratives of hierarchy and uh, control and, you know, keep the masses in their place. So um, seems all very relevant. And the whole idea of interspecies collaboration, you know, so that it's multi perspectives, not just between humans, but between humans and uh, the wider environment that we live in. So it's all really relevant. Um, so this is the article, the book chapter that Stefan and I wrote over the summer. We argue for the relevance of polyphony within IDOCs to eco narratives, which give agency to the more than human, helping us to compose or co create collective, non anthropocentric, and sustainable approaches to the future. We see polyphony within IDOX as making a contribution towards the development of multimodal literacies, which promote our ability to engage with complexity, navigate uncertainty, and celebrate diversity within and across species. And again, very grounded key skills for the 21st century. So that's polyphony. Uh, and then this is now leading into kind of the ideas of metamodernism. So we said contemporary scientific thought does recognize the need to embrace complexity, to consider our place alongside the more than human. We are still seeing these debates playing out in politics through tensions between democracy and authoritarianism, plurality and monoculture, sustainability and ongoing extraction. Our interest in the multiple relates to plurality and diversity as opposed to a multitude of voices that coalesce around conformism, sameness, or unity. So there we're talking about a co some co-creation projects, create a sense of community, um, but within polyphony, we want you know, communities to talk to each other so that we get difference and we get debate. And that was leading us towards democratic values. So while we were talking about polyphony as multi-perspectivism, we were, you know, also thinking, well, when we're talking about polyphony, we're talking about our own democratic values. And it's important to be self-reflexive about that, about the fact we've been brought up with those values of democracy and freedom of speech. But they're not, those values are not um, 
the only systems in the world. And so polyphony, if we're going to genuinely embrace multi-perspectives, you know, we, we've got to kind of break down those hierarchies and think about other, other perspectives as well. But actually, if we're honest with ourselves, the perspective we're interested in is those dem democratic values that we kind of believe in. So we're not being truly polyphonic in that postmodern way, in that we're not giving, we're not being truly relativist. We're not giving equal status to all points of view, whilst we're acknowledging them. And we always, you need to keep yourself in check and be aware of your own biases and your own perspectives. Um, they are still part of who you are. And so you've got to be honest about that as well. And um, it leads you into that whole thorny area of relativism. So um, we're saying we need to think about that and that many of the dominant tools for interactive storytelling work against this kind of reflection in spite of their potential to do otherwise. I'll leave that. Florian can explain that when he does his talk, because I'm sure he'll go into more detail about that and, and about dramatic narratives and um, yeah, the need to develop further types of narrative. I'll touch on it, but Florian will go a lot deeper, I have no doubt. So it's about co-creating the future, breaking down binaries, decentering humans without decentering our responsibilities, breaking free from the grand narratives of modernity and don't always rely on dramatic narrative to achieve this. Because again, as with science, dramatic narrative, it does have its place. I'm not against it, but it's about seeing it as, as a structure, as a system. It's not truth. It's, it's a form of, you know, um, it, it's a form of making sense of the world, but it's definitely not the only one. And it's not always the most helpful one. So yeah, back to dialogism, not monologism. Um, but yeah, you get into this thorny thing about postmodernism and relativism and postmodernism is all about the petite narratives of the everyday and that they all have equal validity, although, you know, that's what you're striving towards. Power structures need to be acknowledged in there and postmodernism does acknowledge that. But it didn't really solve our problem about polyphony being a belief system in, in its own right, you know, if, if, or something that we bring to IDOX uh, as a way of thinking. And that led me to metamodernism, which provides with a framework for understanding ourselves and our societies in a much more complex way. And it contains both indigenous, pre-modern, modern and post-modern cultural elements, provides social norms and a moral fabric for intimacy, spirituality, religion, science and self-exploration all at the same time. Appropriate meaning making is the best prevention against the frustrations that generally lead to authoritarian ideologies and societal instability. So here's that's from this book, Meaning and Hope. So again, you know, this isn't just abstract thought. It's kind of, um, I mean, I may change my position on this, but this is where I'm currently standing. That metamodernism it, it, it takes us it transcends the um, you know are you are you a modernist or are you a postmodernist you know postmodernism was a reaction to modernism modernism had the grand narratives of progress um, the world war you know the world wars said well you know those grand narratives of progress aren't this you know they cause a lot of problems and late capitalism and um, climate emergency and you know the whole culture of growth and consumption doesn't really, it's not fit for purpose. So what do we have? We have postmodernism that critiques all that and says everything is of equal value. And then you get involved in relativist tussles and um, do you give a platform to a Nazi? You know, are there certain points of view that you won't tolerate? How do you square that with the relativism of postmodernism? Um, whereas, now I don't know what the next slide will be. Okay, um, yeah, I've just forgotten what my slides were. So, you know, how can digital tools help us to think and see in ways that aren't putting these things as binaries, but are saying, you know, we can use all of these ways of thought, you know, indigenous knowledge, modernist thinking, postmodernist thinking, we can take bits from all of it and we can put them in a big melting pot and we can see which are the most appropriate ways of thinking for specific tasks. And that's back to what my supervisor taught me. He, he said, you know, you don't have to be this or that. You can say, well, that way of thinking is useful for that, but actually that way of thinking is more useful in that context. And he said, the true polymath 
is able to negotiate different perspectives and, and to work out and through dialogue with others, you know, work out where these different perspectives are useful. And that's what I learned spending a year in Java, in Indonesia as well, where there was a lot of um, black and white magic and, you know, a lot of superstition, but there was a lot of spirituality as well. Um, and how can you put that alongside science and, you know, where, where are these things useful and not so useful? So instead of only looking at what's present, um, metamodernists and the process have a key eye, eye for emergence. So it's this emergent thinking that we're not fixed, we can evolve, we're in a constant process of becoming, you know, um, we strive towards the most comprehensive narrative presently available, but do so through the study of both large and minuscule phenomena, combining the modernist grand histoire with the anti-narrative and petite histoire of postmodernism. And this is the key. The first quality of a meta modern mind is its ability to productively handle paradox. So, sim, you know, and I do, I realize this is what I, this is my mission as a teacher with my students to get them to think actually, I don't have to be this or I don't have to be that. They're not necessarily binary opposites. Maybe a bit of this is interesting there and a bit of that is interesting there. And we don't, these whole models of narrative, because I teach in a film department. You know, the whole models of narrative based on conflict give this idea that, you know, people who a lot of my colleagues who are very much into drama say, but that's the human condition, isn't it? We're, you know, we're destined for conflict and, um, you know, that's what we need to understand. And we need to understand the human condition. I would say, well, it's part of it, but it's not the whole story. And, you know, there's, there's other is, is conflict. And it is kind of how do we negotiate climate emergency? Well, there'll be winners and losers, and um, we just have to accept our fate. Is, is that good enough? You know, are, are there more collaborative collective ways that we can confront these problems? And metamodernism just seems to open up these possibilities for us. Um, so to effectively address conflicts such as global environmental crisis, humans must collectively embrace, and here it says it, a polyphonic environmentalist grand narrative, very different from the narratives accepted by modernists. Cultural theorists who write about metamodernism likewise discuss the recent return to a belief in narratives. I argue that if the authors I discuss are correct, then we morally ought to embrace a metamodernist polyphonic environmentalist grand narrative in order to effectively address an array of global crises. So I thought, well, there's a nice call to arms. You know, if we're going to all collectively come together to collectively solve problems, we need some kind of common structure of feeling maybe, or some common understanding of what we're working towards. Isn't that surely a bit of a grand narrative uh, that's gonna pull us together to, to collectively solve problems? So um, kind of seems to fit. So how can digital documentary or interactive documentary help with this? Obviously, digital documentary isn't going to, <laughs> isn't going to be the great savior that um, is the only way to tackle this, um, but how can it contribute? And I just, I mean, I just sketched these down quite late last night. These are just some jottings really, but one, it can re help reconfigure our relationship with space. And Sharon Daniel talks about sites for spatial navigation, looking at narrative in a more spatial way, rather than having that temporality you know, the temporality of progress, you know, we can be more um, engaged in our localities, more aware of our environment. And IDOX, as we know, creates these more spatial configurations than unisequential formats, perhaps. Um, create simulations to explore alternative scenarios. I think Franzi will be talking about that in her talk a bit. Uh, you know, the speculative futures simulations that have alternative outcomes and endings according to the decisions you put into them. Uh, IDOX could be good for that. Provide layers of context for interrogating complex issues. You know, the database narrative is very good for that or the database that can provide layers of information that you can drill down into. Uh, you can get more of that than you can in a unisequential format. Help us to compare and contrast different points of view. Well, that's, you know, obvious. Again, non-linear, non-dramatic approaches to narrative. Again, we have got the whole of experimental film that's, um, you know, has, has been exploring this, but obviously IDOX opened up new possibilities for that. that. That's been something, you know, there are 
dramatic approaches within IDOCs. You, it's what it's the approach you bring to it that, that matters. But we can certainly explore this and have been right from the word go within IDOCs. Escape from the Western obsession with binaries and causality. So um, I'm sure Florian will talk about his work with Korsakoff. And Stefan and I wrote about that as a using tools like Korsakoff, which are algorithmic, which refuse to create narratives. You know, they don't present you with narratives. Um, it's kind of an anti-narrative tool in a way, which you could use to decolonize and challenge your own narratives and um, get away from the Western obsession, obsession with binaries, winners and losers in narratives and causality, you know, always needing an answer for something. This happened because of this. Well, it could have happened because of this and that and that. And, you know, there's often many complex reasons as to why things happen. But sometimes we look for simple answers when there aren't any. Uh, Co-create with the more than human, um, using digital documentary for that. Lots of potential. And then, yeah, and within all this is this idea of evolving literacies. And some, some perspectives on metamodernism talk about human progress as a, as a phase uh, on the evolution of human progress. I, you know, we, we do have more knowledge. You would hope that with our knowledge, we could use it well and we could progress. And that we now know that the modernist project, you know, of um, extraction and consumption can't keep growing because we're trashing the planet. So how can we use that? How can we develop our literacy? How can we become more metamodern, more able to engage with complexity? And I, I like my teaching, working with 18 year olds and you know, with my children, just looking at young people and how they're working with things like YouTube, which is not, it's not um, dramatic narrative. It's not binaries. Um, there's a lot of, you know, young people are quite optimistic about um, young people, certainly the ones that I teach, you know, that they do have this evolving literacy and they're engaging more with complexity. And but that, there's an example. I think my 17 year old boy is very metamodern <laughs> in that he's not into binaries and he doesn't define himself as this or that. He's, you know, he's, he's quite open minded and quite fluid. And I think things like YouTube, you know, and they, they have not made him like that. But he, they, those tools certainly uh, uh, help to reinforce these more open-ended, non-binary, um, fluid, emergent ways of thinking about the world. So whether that means, I don't, you know, grand narratives of progress and human development, I think, I don't think they're a given. I've discussed this a lot with Florian because I'm supervising his PhD now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's a given and I think we have to work for progress. You know, it's not just gonna happen. Um, but that metamodernism does give us, um, it gives us the language around which we can galvanize around hope and possibility rather, and, um, rather than just total doom and negativity. So um, yeah, that is what I had to say. Um, hope that gives a sense of how metamodernism and polyphony could be helpful and useful approaches with which to approach IDOCs. Uh, as I say, these are approaches that we can take to all our creative practice and all our scholarly thought. And, but you know, where does IDOCs and the digital documentary, where can these ways of thinking be helpful both within documentary practice and also taking those practices to other disciplines and in an interdisciplinary context? So I'll stop there. <laughs>